the cow. Please listen while I tell you now about a most fantastic cow. Miss Milky Daisy was her name, and when, aged seven months, she came to live with us, she did her best to look the same as all the rest. But Daisy, as we all could see, had some kind of deformity, a funny sort of bumpy lump on either side above the rump. Now, not so very long ago, these bumpy lumps began to grow, and three or maybe four months later, I stood there an enthralled spectator. These bumpy lumps burst wide apart, and. Out there came, I cross my heart, of all the wondrous, marvelous things, a pair of gold and silver wings, a cow with wings, a flying cow. I'd never seen one up to now. Oh, Daisy, dear, can this be true? She flapped her wings and up she flew. Most gracefully, she climbed up high. She fairly whizzed across the sky. You should have seen her dive and swoop. She even did a loop the loop. Of course, almost immediately, her picture was on live TV, and millions came each day to stare at Milky Daisy in the air. They shouted, "Jeepers, creepers! Wow! It really is a flying cow!" They laughed and clapped and cheered and waved, and all of them were well behaved. Except for one quite horrid man who'd travelled from Afghanistan, this fellow standing in the crowd raised up his voice and yelled aloud, "That silly cow! Hey, listen, Daisy, I think you're absolutely crazy." Unfortunately, Daisy heard quite clearly every single word. "By gosh!" she cried, "What awful cheek! Who is this silly foreign freak?" She dived. And using all her power, she got to sixty miles an hour. Bomb's gone! She cried. Take that! She said, and dropped a cowpat on his head. The crocodile. No animal is half so vile as Crocky Wock the crocodile. On Saturdays he likes to crunch six juicy children for his lunch, and he especially enjoys just three of each: three girls, three boys. He smears the boys to make them hot with mustard from the mustard pot. But mustard doesn't go with girls; it tastes all wrong with plats and curls. With them, what goes extremely well is butterscotch and caramel. It's such a super marvelous treat when boys are hot and girls are sweet. At least that's Crocky's point of view. He ought to know. He's had a few. That's all for now. It's time for bed. Lie down and rest your sleepy head. Shh. Listen. What is that I hear? Go lumping softly up the stair. Go lock the door and fetch my gun. Go on, child. Hurry quickly. Run. No, stop. Stand back. He's coming in. Oh, look that greasy, greenish skin, the shining teeth, the greedy smile. It's Crocky Wock the crocodile. The tummy beast. One afternoon, I said to Mummy, "Who is this person in my tummy? He must be small and very thin, or how could he have gotten in?" My mother said from where she sat, "It isn't nice to talk like that." It's true, I cried. I swear it, Mummy. There is a person in my tummy. He talks to me at night in bed. He's always asking to be fed. Throughout the day, he screams at me, demanding sugar buns for tea. He tells me it is not a sin to go and raid the biscuit tin. I know quite well it's awfully wrong to guzzle food the whole day long, but really I can't help it, Mummy. Not with this person in my tummy. You horrid child! My mother cried. Admit it right away. You've lied. You're simply trying to produce a silly, asinine excuse. You are the greedy, guzzling brat, and that is why you're always fat. I tried once more. Believe me, Mummy. There is a person in my tummy. 
I've had enough, my mother said. You'd better go at once to bed. Just then, a nicely timed event delivered me from punishment. Deep in my tummy, something stirred, and then an awful noise was heard. A snorting, grumbling, grunting sound that made my tummy jump around. My darling mother nearly died. My goodness, what was that? she cried. At once the tummy voice came through. It shouted, Hey there, listen you. I'm getting hungry. I want eats. I want lots of chocks and sweets. Get me half a pound of nuts. Look snappy or I'll twist your guts. That's him, I cried. He's in my tummy. So now do you believe me, Mummy? But Mummy answered nothing more, for she had fainted on the floor. <laughs> The Toad and the Snail I really am most awfully fond of playing in the lily pond. I take off shoes and socks and coat and paddle with my little boat. Now yesterday, quite suddenly, a giant toad came up to me. This toad was easily as big as any fair-sized fattish pig. He smiled and said, How do you do? Hello, good morning, how are you? His face somehow reminded me of Mummy's sister Emily. The toad said, Don't you think I'm fine? Admire these lovely legs of mine, and I am sure you've never seen a toad so gloriously green. I said, So far as I can see, you look just like Aunt Emily. He said, I bet Aunt Emily can't jump one half as high as me. Hop on my back, young friend, he cried. I'll take you for a marvellous ride. As I got on, I thought, oh, blimey, oh, dearie me, how wet and slimy. Sit further back, he said. That's right, I'm going to jump, so hold on tight. He jumped. Oh, how he jumped. By gum, I thought my final hour had come. My wretched eardrums popped and fizzed. My eyeballs watered. Up we whizzed. I clung on tight. I shouted, how much further are we going now? Toad said, his face all wreathed in smiles. With every jump, it's fifty miles. Quite literally, we jumped all over from Scotland to the cliffs of Dover. Above the cliffs we stopped for tea, and Toad said, gazing at the sea, What do you say we take a chance and jump from England into France? I said, Oh dear, do you think we ought to? I'd hate to finish in the water. But Toads, you'll find, don't give a wink for what we little children think. He didn't bother to reply. He jumped. You should have seen us fly. We simply soared across the sea, the marvellous Mr. Toad and me. Then down we came, and down and down, and landed in a funny town. We landed hard. In fact, we bounced. We're there. It's France, the Toad announced. He said, you must admit it's grand to jump into a foreign land. No boats, no bicycles, no trains, no cars, no noisy aeroplanes. Just then we heard a fearful shout. Oh, heavens above, the toad cried out. I turned and saw a frightening sight. On every side, to left, to right, people were running down the road, running at me and Mr. Toad, and every person, man and wife, was brandishing a carving knife. It didn't take me very long to figure there was something wrong. And yet how could a small boy know, for nobody had told me so, that Frenchmen aren't like you or me. They do things very differently. They won't say yards. They call them meters. And they're the most peculiar eaters. A Frenchman frequently regales himself with half a dozen snails. The greedy ones will gulp a score of these foul brutes and ask for more. In many of the best hotels the people also eat the shells. Imagine that. My stomach turns. One might as well eat slugs or worms. But wait. Read on a little bit. You haven't heard the half of it. These French go even more agog if someone offers them a frog. You'd better fetch a basin quick in case you're going to be sick. The bits of frog they like to eat are thighs and calves and toes and feet. The French will gobble loads and loads of legs they chop off frogs and toads. They think it's absolutely ripping to guzzle frogs' legs fried in dripping. That's why the whole town and their wives were rushing us with carving knives. They screamed in French, Well, I'll be blowed! What legs there are upon that toad! Chop them, skin them, cook them, fry them! All of us are going to try them. Toad, I cried, I'm not a funk, but ought we not to do a bunk? These rascals haven't come to greet you. All they want to do is eat you. Toad turned his head and looked at me and said, as cool as cool could be, 
Calm down and listen carefully, please. I often come to France to tease these crazy French who long to eat my lovely tender froggy meat. I am a magic toad, he cried, and I don't ever have to hide. Stay where you are, don't move, he said, and pressed a button on his head. At once there came a blinding flash, and then the most almighty crash, and sparks were bursting all around, and smoke was rising from the ground. When all the smoke had cleared away, the Frenchmen, with their knives, cried, Hey, where is the toad? Where has he gone? You see, I now was sitting on a wonderfully enormous snail. His shell was smooth and brown and pale, and I was so high off the ground that I could see for miles around. The snail said, Hello, greetings, hail, I was a toad, now I'm a snail. I had to change the way I looked to save myself from being cooked. Oh, snail, I said, I'm not so sure. I think they're starting up once more. The French were shouting, What a snail! Oh, what a monster! What a whale! He makes the toad look teachy small. This lovely snail meat for us all. We'll bake the creature in his shell and ring aloud the dinner bell. Get garlic, parsley, butter, spices. We'll cut him into fifty slices. Come sharpen up your carving knives. This is the banquet of our lives. I murmured through my quivering lips, Oh, snail, I think we've had our chips. The snail replied, I disagree. These greedy French, they'll not eat me. But on they came. They screamed, Yahoo! Surround the brute and run him through! Good gracious, I could almost feel the pointed blades, the shining steel. But snail was cool as cool could be. He turned his head and winked at me, and murmured, Au revoir, farewell, and pulled a lever on his shell. I looked around. The snail had gone. And now who was I sitting on? Oh, what relief, what joy, because at last I'd found a friend. It was the gorgeous, glamorous, absurd, enchanting, roly-poly bird. He turned and whispered in my ear, Well, fancy seeing you, my dear. Then up he went in glorious flight. I clutched his neck and hung on tight. We fairly raced across the sky, the roly-poly bird and I, and landed safely just beyond the fringes of the lily pond. When I got home, I never told a solitary single soul what I had done or where I'd been or any of the things I'd seen. I did not even say I rode upon a giant jumping toad, because if I had, I knew that they would not believe me anyway. But you and I know well it's true. We know I jumped. We know I flew. We're sure it all took place, although not one of us will ever know. We'll never, never understand why children go to Wonderland. Oh, 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 oh,